Let's give a warm Georgia Tech welcome to John Winsett. Thank you for that. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes. All right, good. How's everyone doing? All right, well, I'm John Winsett, and uh, I'm here to talk to you about entrepreneurship. And I had named it Take Your Shot, because taking your shot means going and grabbing that opportunity, you know, claiming your destiny, you know, preparing yourself, positioning yourself, you know, to look for and wait for that shot. So uh, before we get started, I was just going to tell you a little bit about me and, um, and NPI. Uh, you know, I'm CEO and founder of NPI Financial. Now, funny enough, we're not really a financial company, traditionally, that you might think of, uh, but we do help our clients save money. And we do it by uh, using pricing data and vendor intelligence to make sure they're getting the very best deal. So we help companies like these be protected and save money against companies like those. So we, um, we've been on national news broadcasts like CNN, CNBC, Fox, and we've uh, won numerous awards, which the one I'm most proud of is actually the best place to work in Atlanta for two years running. We're really excited about that. It, uh, it's highly coveted by companies here in Atlanta, and for us to be a winner was, was a big thing for us. So through these 12 plus years that we've been in business, we've uh, worked with over 450 clients. And we like to think that we really uh, have brought a lot of value to them. All right, so that's a little bit about MPI. Now, you know, I look over the audience here, and it looks like mostly students. I, too, was a student at, at Georgia Tech. And while I was here, I so wanted to be an entrepreneur. If there was a class with entrepreneurship in the, the title, I took it. If there was a speaker that was on that topic, I went. And there was some good stuff I learned. Uh, you know, I, a lot of things I heard were, were, were like um, how entrepreneurs always sweat about payroll or uh, how to find funding and, all, funding, and all those things are important. But what I really wanted to hear was what, you know, what, what skills did it take to start? What traits did I need to possess? And so today's talk, I was gonna kind of walk you through some of the, the tenets that I found important for me. But first, let me just start with this. Do you know who this is? You read the, the bio. Oh, you know him. You probably have a $10 bill in your pocket too, right? So it's not George Washington or John Adams, it's Alexander Hamilton. And he is on the $10 bill. But he wasn't president. Why do you think he's on the $10 bill? I mean, he, you know, you got George Washington on the $1 bill. He's the father of our country. We got Abe Lincoln on the $5 bill. He was, you know, arguably the best president we had. And, um, but here's Alexander Hamilton hanging out on a $10 bill. Why? Well, for one, he was a fighter in the American Revolution. He was George Washington's top aide. He was an architect of the Constitution. He designed and built the federal monetary system, which was, was crucial. It sounds like a boring monetary thing, but it's actually crucial because it, it united our country, which was at the time a bunch of fractured states. It united them uh, financially, which led to them being united politically, which then created the most powerful country in the world. But what a lot of people don't know is Alexander Hamilton was actually born in the West Indies. He was orphaned, penniless, he found his way to New York City at like age 20, where he knew no one. And in a few years, he wound up as, as George Washington's right-hand man. How does that happen? Well, some of the traits he possessed was he was scrappy. He was hungry. He wanted to leave his mark. He wanted to take his shot. And, you know, um, he's been a role model for so many entrepreneurs. In fact, you know, the founder of Uber 
has, if you go to the founder of Uber's uh, Twitter handle, he has an image of Alexander Hamilton on his page. You know, he calls him America's first capitalist. That's the type of impression that, it, if you really know Hamilton, that he, that he left. So when we think about his story, it's a good time to think about your story. You know, what's, how, does, how do you want your story to go? Because now is an important time. You're in a very enviable position. You know, Warren Buffett says that if you are born speaking English, you've, you've won the lottery. I can tell you, if you're a student at Georgia Tech, you've hit the Powerball because you're perfectly positioned to do pretty much whatever you want to do if you put your mind to it. So I was going to share a little bit about my story and highlight some core tenets that I found that helped me along my way. And um, we'll see where we go from there. So, you know, if, I don't know if you've heard of my accent, but I'm actually from Alabama. I was born in Tuscaloosa. I spent the first half of my childhood in, um, on a cattle farm in northern Alabama. Uh, at age 11, my mom, who was a hippie, thought it was a good idea to move me and her up to a mountaintop in Tennessee where we lived in this cabin thing. Here, I'll show you. Um, without running water or electricity. I was homeschooled. We had to hike 45 minutes up a hill from where we parked our car uh, with groceries or whatever we needed to, to take up the mountain. You know, that's where you know, we had to walk up 45 minutes. We had to bathe in springs. You know how cold springs are? It's like 57 degrees. You know what that does? That, that chill of water does to a young, growing boy's self-esteem? <laughs> but, you know, I had to persevere. I had to challenge uh, myself to stay positive. And, um, and it wasn't easy. You know, there's a lot of downturns that happen when you've got a single parent, only child family and uh, not a lot of money to go around. And you know, my mom, bless her heart, she was hell-bent to do this journey, and, um, and I had to do it with her. But it was not, um, you know, I found ways to enjoy myself, like hunting and camping, but I would much rather had heat and um, a TV, and dare I say, a, an Atari video game. This was the 70s, so, you know, you guys probably don't know what Ataris are. But, um, but, you know, I was a, a Four Seasons hotel kind of guy before I even knew what that meant. I know what it means now, but I didn't know what it meant then. But um, I certainly was. Um, my mom seemed to be fine with living in this way, and she just, you know, did her best to, to get us through it. Um, you know, but she seemed to just come across the worst luck. She had. She had bad car karma. She would, um, you know, she would drive back one day and like the driver's side window would be completely shattered. Where it had been perfectly fine when she left that morning, she came back and there's not a shard of glass and she seemed unsure of what happened. And, um, and we'd wrap it up and, you know, keep it, uh, you know, from the rain getting in, but you couldn't see out of it. And, um, but that's the way we lived. And, you know, there was not enough money to replace it and we had to just live that way. But it, what it taught me was that I just, I had to just get my way, you know, find a way out of this. You know, get control of my, my life. And at the time, it was through good grades. And I just focused on getting the, uh, doing the best I could at school and just keeping positive and just getting through it. And so I got into Georgia Tech, which was, um, was exciting for me. Atlanta was the big city. And, um, and I, had to, I had to start summer quarter. I don't know if any of you had to do that. But uh, it's, it means I didn't qualify for you know, a fall quarter slot. So I had to come in summer quarter. But I was fine with that. Uh, you know, when I say I left after graduation of high school, I mean the morning after graduation of high school, not noon, not later that day, that morning I packed up my car and drove to Atlanta. And it was, um, it was exciting, I mean Atlanta was the big city, um, 
but I arrived talking all funny and uh, you know saying things like uh, would you turn off that light and could I have a Sprite <laughs> and so I had to correct that and um, but it, it was exciting because Georgia Tech was full of very smart people working hard to do their best and that's what I wanted to do and I remember I moved into Harrison dorm uh, if you can picture where that is I think it's still here um, and that morning I woke up there it was the first morning in like seven years that I didn't have to build a fire to keep warm. And so it was like heaven. Like I finally, I did it. I got out of it. And, and I thought back at that moment that life could be so different if I hadn't persevered through that. And so I, you know, think about the first core tenets that I wanted, wanted to share with you is that stay positive, be optimistic, despite whatever challenges come, it's a mark of a good entrepreneur. You know, Steve Jobs says that um, what separates successful entrepreneurs from non-successful is perseverance. That's his quote. So I think that's enough for me to believe it. So, I graduate Georgia Tech and I start interviewing and in my mind I think I want to go into finance I have that movie Wall Street going through my head and I want to go uh, to the, the finance world and I go through my interviews and part way through I said you know what I, I've been talking about being an entrepreneur maybe I should do this and I didn't know much I'd gone to school I'd been a lifeguard for a couple of summers and I said you know what I'm gonna start up a pool management company and I was just so you know just charged to, to do something entrepreneurial and so I started up community pool management CPM not too inspiring but it's what I did and I was uh, selling to subdivisions that were sprouting up around suburban Atlanta and and I realized I didn't even know how to run a business. And so it, I remember the day it dawned on me, I was like, I need to uh, get back to interviewing and get back to companies. And it, it reminds me of, uh, I, I, I'm on a round table with uh, some entrepreneurs who are helping early stage entrepreneurs get off the ground. And you know, I was talking to a, a university president that's part of the round table and he said you know all recent grads you know they want to become entrepreneurs and and when you ask them he says it's because they want to make money which is, which when I hear that I don't think that's a bad motive I think it's a great motive but they but what he added was that they all want to like start the next new hot app and that's where I take a little bit exception to it because I don't think to be an entrepreneur you need to start the next Uber. You can be an entrepreneur in a big company. You can be an entrepreneur in a mid-sized company. And how I know this is as I was struggling about do I go on with my interviews with finance houses or do I go start a pool management company, um, I decided to go and learn the ropes first. And so I resumed my interviews. I got my offer that I was shooting for from Merrill Lynch, which was like the top place to go. And, uh, and I was elated upon hearing the news that I had been accepted. And they said, look, you know, you start August 1st. Uh, it's about a month from now. We'll, we, you know, we, we recruit in classes, and we'll take you up to Princeton and, uh, and, and start training. So I was like, great. So I have a month to kill. So in that month, uh, I came across a company called Sundata. They were in north of Atlanta, and they sold IBM hardware. When I say IBM hardware, it's like mainframes. It's like um, you know, big honking computers. And, and it was small. It was like 200 people. And you could feel the energy and spirit when you walked in. I mean, I was sat in that lobby waiting for that interview, and people were buzzing by and just super jazzed about being there and, and I compare that to what I 
felt when I was at Merrill Lynch interviewing there, and it was, um, you know, everybody's buttoned down and just, you know, very um, serious, and, and, and that's not what I wanted. So I learned more about the Sunday opportunity. It turned out to be great. It was great starting pay, double that what Merrill Lynch was paying. And uh, it was um, great travel perks. Uh, I was going to be selling IBM gear to Europe, so I get to travel to Europe. Loved it. And so I did it. I took Sun Data over Merrill Lynch. I called the Merrill Lynch guy, and he was like, what? Um, but I, it felt right. It felt like the right thing to do. So it turned out to be fantastic. And it was a type of job that I got to exercise some entrepreneurial muscles. Um, I was a broker. I got to build my book of business. I got to you know, build up my clientele. And, um, but I had an organization to support me. And I just remembered, you know, I had a manager who was teaching me the ropes and, and, uh, and it was silly things that like, you know, I had never written a business letter to a client. And it sounds easy from where I'm at now, but back then I just, you know, I didn't even know what was appropriate, what wasn't. And I remember, you know, trying to figure out how to end the business letter. You know, do you put sincerely, you know, yours truly? And they were like, no, 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 just put, you know, please feel free to contact me if you have any questions. And I'm like, that's it? Oh my God, that's brilliant. You know, because when you don't know something, it feels so, uh, you know, it, it, everything feels like it's genius when it's given to you. So I just absorbed all that. And th those were the little things that helps that help makes a person professional that I wouldn't have done if I had just gone straight out of college. So I continued to work uh, with some data. I was learning. I was taking any opportunity. If they said, hey, you want to handle this? I'm like, yep, yep, give it to me. I want it. And it really you know, allowed me to uh, expand my capabilities. So when I joined Siegel Software in 1995, which was a startup, and they wanted to hire people and open offices. I was all in. And then they said, how about, um, how about uh, opening a, an office in London? And I was, you know, if you would have asked 1989 recent grad John Winsett to open an office in London, I would have withered and died. But when 1997, John Wynn said, heard it. I was like, I love it. I'm at least halfway qualified. I'd done business in Europe, check. I had um, opened offices and hired people, check. And, um, and so I said, yes, let's do it. The one thing that I was not prepared for was um, driving on the wrong side of the road, which you know, how many people here have driven in England? And how'd you find it, easy? No. <laughs> it's a mess. Everything's counterintuitive. So just picture, in fact, I've got a picture. Uh, the steering wheel's on the right side of the car. And you're on the, the car's on the left side of the road. And so like to turn right, you're turning across oncoming. It's just, it, it's, it's a mess. Let me see if I've got the. Yeah, okay. It blows me away that they let Americans fly overseas, um, jet lagged, uh, red eyed from uh, lack of sleep and a gallon of wine, and just say, hey, here's rent a car. And, but that's what they did on my inaugural trip. And so I, I Google searched 1997 uh, Jetta, because that's what they had given me. And it was a diesel five-speed. And you know, so imagine all the things we just talked about being on the wrong side of the road and then having to like shift with this hand. I can't even make the motion. And, um, it, but it sticks with me as one of these defining moments of where like I just wanted to go cry. Because, and I'm a driver, I love to drive. But I remember sitting in that hotel room, I had flown over to open up the office and I have to go 
find a place to live, locate an office, buy computers and printers, hire people, sell to the UK companies, and I can't, and I'm afraid to drive. And I would just sit in my hotel room, just psyching myself up, going, I've got to do it. I've just got to do it. And it, I did it, and it was not pretty. I had people yelling at me. I, um, they somehow knew I was American. I don't know if it's because of my driving or my haircut or what, but they, you know, they would yell stupid yank and those kind of things. So. But, um, but afterwards, you know, after about, I guess it was after about three or four months, I had kind of, you know, I was ready to like turn on the radio and, and get through it. But I wanted to show you this uh, license plate because one of the things at Siegel that I really did, even though I didn't own Siegel, it was not mine, I treated it like I did. And whenever there was a new product launch, I was Mr. Insert new product name. And if I was asked to um, launch a new team, I would go, I was so committed to it that I would put the name, this, is, this looks like Blazin, um, but it's Blue Zone, which was I had on my car for two years um, as, a, as a sign of my commitment to the team. And so the second core tenets that I wanted to share from that chapter is take ownership even though you don't and always be learning. Always show some curiosity on what you're seeing. Very strong traits for entrepreneurship. So, um, I was gonna share about how MPI started. Siegel had gone public, I had moved back from London I, um, the markets had cooled, the, you know, the dot-com bubble had burst, the uh, Enron disaster had just chilled the, the business atmosphere. And, um, and so me and another partner came up with this idea that we were gonna change the world, that, uh, the change the way the world purchased IT, technology, hardware, software, services. We'd been selling it on the vendor side for years. We knew how the pricing was all over the map and, uh, and how company A paid a different price for the same product than company B did, sometimes by twofold. And we wanted to go and, and protect the buyers. And so we came up with the idea of Negotiation Partners, Inc., NPI. Which is funny because it, we're not incorporated, we weren't incorporated, we were an LLC, but we liked the way it sounded, so we were MPI. And I remember, I remember that we, um, we wanted to make a big splash, so we had chosen this conference that it was a CIO conference. Does everyone know what CIOs are? The Chief Information Officer. So we had chosen that conference, and uh, it was $55,000. So I took out a second mortgage on my house, and I'll never forget stro stroking that check for 55,000. That's a lot of money when you don't have any money coming in. And we showed up to this conference. We had spent all the money for the sponsorship, so we had no money for the booth. Now, if you've ever been to a trade show, it's dozens and dozens of booths, and you know, it was the typical list of vendors, Microsoft, Oracle, they were all there with their fancy booths and lights, and and flat screens, and all we had was, you know, the slot for the booth, which was curtains, a table, two chairs, that most people kind of move to the side when, you know, they move their booth in, and we had a little white sign that said MPI LLC, which really just to help sponsors locate their slot, but we left it there because that was all we had. But we, but we, we just had so many ideas and we just wanted to talk to CIOs and just you know, tell them what our company was all about. And so we talked to over 100 CIOs. And they would ask, some would ask, you know, wh where's your booth? And we just, you know, we said, look, uh, it was supposed to be shipped to Orlando and it went, ended up in Ontario, it won't be, you know, just we made it up. But that's kind of that guerrilla type entrepreneurism that it sometimes takes to, to get through the early days. But the, the CIOs loved it. So much so that at the end of the conference, the, um, the CIOs voted on what they thought the best solution that they saw at the show was, and we won. And 
I mean, we beat out IBM, SAP, all the big names that were there in this two-man little company. Um, one best solution, and it put us on the map. And we landed 12 clients. And let me tell you something, the most important thing to an entrepreneur is not any of these core tenants. It's having clients. Because they're what's gonna keep you alive and what keep you in business. And so we landed 12 of them. And the hard, hard work began. And we uh, had to find an office. We had to build out our processes. We had to launch a marketing plan. We had all these things that we had to do. We had, and lest us not forget that we had to deliver quality service to our clients, which we did. But what happens then is once you have people and you have a mission, a culture starts to bloom. And either the culture is going to be a good culture or it's going to be a bad culture. Hopefully you're going to make it a good one. And what we realized is we needed a purpose. Because if you work hard without a purpose, you're stressed out. If you work hard and you have a pur purpose, that's called passion. So I, I don't know if you guys have seen um, Simon Sinek's TED Talk, Start With The Why. Probably one of the biggest, uh, the, the highest viewed TED Talk there is. Um, if you guys haven't made it a part of your routine to watch TED Talks, you should because it's a great glimpse of what goes on in the real world. Anyway, he had the what, the how, and the why. And just to give you a, kind of an example of what that means is um, we'll use Apple. You know, their what is they make hardware, computers, and devices. That's their what. Their how is Great design, cool ergonomics, easy to use, intuitive. That's their how. But why do they do it? And it's their why that separates them from Dell. Dell has the same what and how as Apple. But Apple is a lot cooler and about 100 times more valuable than Dell. So what Apple's why, uh, why is, is they challenge the status quo, which we all love. They make you think differently. They had a whole ad campaign, Think Different. This was 10 years ago. And they had like Albert Einstein with the iPod, if you guys remember that. But what they were speaking to was their purpose. They weren't saying that the iPod holds a thousand songs. They were saying, think differently. That's their why. So with MPI, our what and how and why, our what is we help companies save money. Our how is we do it with data and intelligence. But what is our why? And that why is you know, this passion for protecting our clients from overspending with, these, with the vendor machine that's out there. It's leveling the playing field against vendors. And, and companies buy off on that. Because we work with companies like Boeing, Morgan Stanley, GE. GE has a Harvard MBA in their purchasing department. What, what does you know, MPI going to bring to them? Well, they bought into the passion that we have for delivering the tools they need to, to save the money. So as the culture emerges, you've got to have a purpose. It's very important. So, you know, with what, what I think is funny is, you know, I had um, started this, I mean, this title of this talk was, you know, entrepreneurship, you know, take your shot, now may be the best time <laughs> to start your business. Um, and I've just spent 20 minutes telling you how it's taken um, 20 years to become an entrepreneur. So let me clarify that a little bit. First of all, it is the best time. It, it's, in this day and age, it's easier now to start a business than ever before for a few reasons. One is technology has developed to a point where it's not, you don't have to invent technology. You can just simply find a unique application for that technology that solves a real world problem. It's so much easier than Thomas Edison with magnets and you know, making things uh, work like he had to do back then. Now you can just, figure out a new way to do something using 
sensors in everyone's cell phones, as an example. The other thing that's changed is crowdsourcing. You know, what used to take a whole lot of money to, to develop something now can be done quickly, um, cheaply. You can rent a whole team of developers for pennies on the dollars. You can rent PhDs by the hour. There's not a, an expertise you can't attain worldwide now. I have a friend who's also a Georgia Tech graduate who's been a very successful entrepreneur. He uh, has sold two companies. Um, he just built an application, an entire application for $800. It's crazy. I mean, that would have taken tens of thousands of dollars or more you know, just a few years ago. The other, another reason why it's easier is this notion of crowdfunding. I think you guys have probably heard about Kickstarter. You know, it's pretty, what, 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 I, what I found fascinating about crowdfunding is it's not just about the money. You can start a campaign and raise money. It's a way to, to vet your ideas, um, market test your concept to a crowd, have them give feedback, be the early buyers even to your uh, products, and, and raise a little money along the way. And it's not uncommon for venture capitalists, VCs, to, uh, to tell you, i tell you what, we're not interested, go on crowdfunding uh, you know, sites and uh, raise your money that way. And then they'll watch how the response is on your campaign, and if it's great, they'll pounce and offer you $10 million. So it's a, it's a, it's a new way to, uh, to leverage some of the um, online communities, which that's the other one, communities. Um, communities are different than crowds. Crowds are, are, is like everyone online. Communities are pulled from crowds. So for example, if you have a, um, a new product that, uh, that you want to get feedback on, Communities will provide that support. Communities are compelled by your idea. They're, um, they believe in what you're doing. And so, what you can, so communities can actually you know, lift you up, share your ideas with their networks, and allow things to go viral. That didn't exist um, not so long ago. You know, Facebook is a great example of this. You know, they launched in Harvard. Only Harvard had it. And that was popular, and then they just released it to Ivy League, and that was popular, and then they released it to the university system. I mean, I remember clearly when I couldn't join Facebook because you had to have a .edu address. Zuckerberg didn't know it, but it was, uh, he was leveraging community dynamics when he, uh, he launched Facebook, and he's done all right from it. So, um, you know, there's a lot of these type of um, nuances that are around today. Um, I wanted to show you the, uh, a book I read about a year ago that really, if I, if I was to sell MPI and just be nothing else to do, I would go through and take each chapter, it's a guidebook on how to start a business in this day and age. And I would um, notate every chapter and live, you know, live to it. So if you're interested, that's where I'm, I pulled that from. So the third and final set of tenets there is boldness, risk taking, and culture. And now we're back to Hamilton. I think of why I love this story so much. Uh, there's a Broadway play that, um, that is like the top selling Broadway play that actually puts his story to hip hop. <laughs> and it's, it's fantastic. And, uh, but I think I, why I love that story so much is that he came from nothing and had no reason to hope for anything. And just from sure scrappiness and hunger, he attained great accomplishments. And not only does you know, not only did he help birth this nation, he really embodies what the American spirit is. Because we're lucky. Because not all countries are like this, and we're lucky to live in America where we can even have ideas and have the possibility to to put them into reality. So 
kind of as a final slide, I'll, that's all the, the tenets in one. So I started this exercise when, you know, I had decided to talk about this with you guys. I started this with, um, you know, what are the, the traits that I think mean the most? Um, you know, you've heard my story. It's what really has, um, I think, got me through all the, the trials and tribulations. But it's kind of now your time to think about what's your story? What, what, what do you want your story to be? How, what traits are you gonna bring to the table? And you know, the, uh, the future is yours. And that's it, thank you. Oh, sorry, yeah, any questions? Yeah, for questions. Yeah, um, so you, you mentioned how you, your company was named two years in a row as the best place to work for in Atlanta. Um, I'm interested in terms of like your culture as like your why or how your company operates within. What do you think made you guys um, win? Like what, how, how do you think you guys win that? Like is it how people interact inside? Um, are they given opportunities to like express themselves? Like what, what do you think um, got you guys at award? It's a great question, and, it's, um, and I could probably go on for a long time about it, but I'll give you a couple of nuggets here. You know, one is, um, you know, you can put your values out on your website. You can etch them in marble in your foyer. It doesn't really matter. Uh, your values are set by who you hire and who you fire. And, you know, in 2015, MPI, you know, we're, we're under 50 people. Uh, we, hired seven pe we hired seven people. We fired seven people, and for different reasons, but we owe it to our team that we only want great fits. Because a C player will make an A player play like a B player, and we only want A players, and so people feel that. So that's one nugget. The other is we're kind of a work hard, play hard kind of company. You know, we, um, we work hard, but if we, and we hold ourselves accountable. We always set out quarterly goals, and for every goal that we hit, we get a half-day Friday, meaning that we shut down the company a half-day Friday. So everyone's trying to hit all eight goals so that we can get most Fridays off half-day. Um, so we do little things like that. Um, we also put big goals out there for the year. And, you know, typically we will... Um, uh, let's see, like, uh, you know, every, at the end of every year, January becomes a planning month, and we have a kickoff. And, uh, and the kickoff is either held somewhere locally, or if we hit a goal, we'll take the whole company to New Orleans. The whole company. This past year, 2015, we set a big goal, 35%, it's a stretch goal, 35% year-over-year -year growth. And we hit it. So we took the whole company to Vegas. That's a good way to get best place to work in Atlanta. <laughs> so, thank you for your question. Could you go back to the story of uh, when you were at the conference that you paid $55,000 for? Could you elaborate on what you used as a sales pitch to let people know that you weren't just a, uh, you were, you were a company and not two guys in a garage? And then could you also elaborate on, was there anybody else in the market space at the time doing what you do and how did you fight them off and win? It's a great question, and uh, and I hope I can um, live up to the uh, to the quality of that question. Um, so that was 2003 that that conference happened. Uh, funny enough, there wasn't really anyone else in the market doing what we were doing. The closest was a company called Gartner. Um, and Gartner was a very large company. I don't know if you've heard of Gartner. They're you know, multi-billion dollar. But they have a practice that kind of did what we did. Um, so we would say things like, we're a boutique specialized uh, firm that uh, is Gartner-like. So that would connect the listener's mind to what we kind of where we sat. And um, we made up a couple of things. We said we had clients. And we kind of did. We had a great relationship with a client we had back, and he said um, he would. We, we actually did some work with him, but the, he never paid us. 
<laughs> but we used him as a reference. And, uh, and I, I, I want to emphasize, in the early days of a startup, you really got to get clever with how you do it. Now, I, don't, I, I would never um, suggest that you should push your integrity, but you've got to get, think of it like a guerrilla type you know, warfare. I mean, you're, you're scrapping your way. And so we, we got very clever with our messaging on our website. Um, we, uh, we touted capabilities that we'd never used before, but we felt we could live up to. So, and just kind of as a final part to your question, which is what did we tell CIOs that, you know, who are these guys? We, we said we were a small group. So we never like said we we're 40 people. But, you know, we, you know, we said that uh, we were working with several companies. And uh, what we meant in our minds is that we were simply, you know, talking to them about working with them. <laughs> but the way that our service worked, it's not like it, you know, in the early days, we would only get paid if we saved them money. So we just wanted a, a shot at saving them money. And so it wasn't like they were paying for something they would never get, if that makes sense. So it's, um, um, that it was, it was a tense conference. $55,000, did I mention that figure? <laughs> so thank you for your question. Um, so you were talking about like all these successes you've had in your life and you know getting into Georgia Tech getting your dream job then getting a dream year job and um, Like all the success you've had with your company you've the 55,000 paid off um, So this might sound like a kind of cliche question, but I think for the most of us um, We're gonna experience failures in our life, especially as entrepreneurial entrepreneurial minded people, right? Not everybody has those successes. Can you talk about something? Um, like one of your biggest failures and maybe more of how like you dealt with that in the company itself to keep morale up, keep people believing in you, um, and you know, keep investors on your side. Yeah, uh, it, you know, failure is a part of life, it's a failure part of business, and certainly entrepreneurship, and you've got to get your mind in a place that um, you don't see failures as a negative thing. You, f you fail forward, that's a, that's a Google innovation principle. They have eight, one of them is, fail forward and fail fast. And um, so you can see it's working this, uh, you know, I'm just giving you the rosy glasses kind of uh, view of everything. But there was a lot of trials and tribulations through my career. Um, I, think we got, I think we got lucky on a few things. This landing 12 clients at the first show was pretty fortunate. But I mean, the stress that we went through during that time was, you know, and we, we lost deals, we spent a lot of money trying to win deals. I mean, there's a lot of little failures through all of it, but you just keep failing forward and just, and just keep trying. So uh, there, if you go online, and I, I, I recommend you do this, if you go online and look up entrepreneurial quotes, about half of them talk about dealing with the psychology of failing. And it's, it's uplifting because you realize that you never truly fail. You only learn. You know, in fact, there's one from Thomas Edison that said, you know, uh, I, ne I have never failed once. I, I discovered 10,000 ways that won't work. <laughs> so, uh, it, you know, that's why you don't hear a lot of failure talk out of me is because, you know, I just keep trying to put, it's, number, you know, the, it's the positive, keep positive. Now, you don't want to be, you know, autistic about it. <laughs> But, uh, but you should, you know, put the best, you know, learn from it, take an opportunity for it. Hello. Um, so I'm wondering how old were you when you left your job at Siegel and uh, decided to start your own company and how you balance between um, having established yourself at your dream job and deciding to leave that company and go ahead and take this big risk to start your own company, especially with the $55,000 price tag associated with that. I felt that was a big risk at the time, um, certainly with my partner who was high risk. Um, so let's see. So to, to answer your first question, um, I was 35 when I left Siegel. 
and uh, and I and I looked younger. Like I, I remember feeling a little bit out of place starting my own company, talking to CIOs about how I could help them save money. I remember that. And I, 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 when I started getting gray hair, I, I kind of enjoyed that. Um, um, but you know, through um, you know, you know, through the, I, I feel a little bit like I. I it was an enchanted startup phase because I l laid out the big bet of $55,000. And there was a sorted cost to go along with that. Um, so maybe the entire bet was 75 k And I knew I could talk my way back to Siegel if it didn't work. So I had that as a landing pad. Now, it would be horrible if I burnt through that money and had to go back to Siegel. But it was a 75 k bet. And we got lucky, and we landed 12 72 k clients. So whatever that works out to be, um, it funded us for a year. And, um, and that's a little bit unusual, but not always. But um, that's why I like B2B. B2C, you know, business to consumer on, you know, entrepreneur deals, it seems like it has a higher upside, like you can just scale, like you know, Uber goes from $10,000 valuation to 60 billion through B2C, but B2B, uh, where it's business to business, it's a little more controlled and a little more, I feel like, uh, you know, it's, it's, it may not pay off as quickly, uh, you know, and scales as quickly as a B2C, but I, I'm in control of it a little more. You know, I can, it's really, because the thing about business to business is it's really you with someone who's making a decision. And I love that dynamic because because I, I enjoy it. So thank you for your question. We have a question in the middle. Mr. Winsett, uh, can you please talk about um, your experience being an entrepreneur in another country um, abroad and how that shaped and changed your story when you returned home? It was amazing. It really was. Um, uh, let's see how, first of all, it, if you ever have a chance to work <clears throat> internationally, <clears throat> where um, it, it's, it's really fun to be an expat, that's what they call them, uh, and because you're special, you're different. You know, when I was in London and I was you know, showing up for meetings, they would listen to me a lot more closely. <clears throat> so <clears throat> let me get some water. Um, So, um, but challenging your, yourself and like making that happen, like the car story, that was one of, um, you know, a hundred things that happen, happens when you're there. And you kind of come back, a, a, um, you know, a different person. And I've said before that, uh, you know, before then I, was always, I always felt like an imposter, you know, like, a, like I shouldn't be, because uh, I was always young doing the roles I was doing. Um, but when I came back from London and I came back into the States, I was a full-fledged executive and no one could take that away from me. So it's, I would highly recommend you, you find opportunities like that. John, I have a quick question for you. Um, you've been in both types of startup environments, a products company or software products company, and now a services startup. Could you just contrast the differences between being a an entrepreneur driving a services business versus an entrepreneur driving a products business, and is it harder or easier to than either one? And I guess the second part of the question is that one of the issues that you may have with service businesses is the ability to scale and what the end game is. And could you also comment on that as it relates to what your plans are regarding uh, your company? <laughs> um, let's see. So services is easy because you can make up your product as you go. Um, you know, it, uh, you know, we're a very niche, specialized consulting company, so there's a little less of that, but you take a, like a, a Deloitte or Accenture, and you know, a client asks them, can they do X, and they say yes, because they'll figure it out one way or the other. You can't do that with a product company. Product company is very hard. I mean, we had great developers at Siegel, uh, and our product was rock solid and water tight. 
Um, but there's issues. You know, there's issues with um, integration into the environment. There's you know bugs. There's new releases. There's um, customer support. Um, so when a, if you're doing a startup, I think it's easier to start up a services company. But you highlighted the biggest problem with a services company, and that is it doesn't scale easy. I mean, um, you know, you can grow 100, 200, 300 percent year over year with a product company because you can. It's repeatable. You know, all you're doing is shipping air. You're not. Uh, you know, you don't have to add a body for every time you ship a product. Um, and uh, but that's not like it is on services. I mean, you know, for every big chunk of growth. You've got to add that much amount of labor, and that increases your EBITDA risk. Because um, you know when you've got 10 people and you're making 20% EBITDA, that's pretty good. Uh, but when you've got 50 people and you're making 15% EBITDA, and it can go this way or that way, if you miss a, a quarter with you know sales, you can, you go in the red real quick with a services business. About your aspirations as well, and what the end game you see for? Uh, I mean, do you want to continue to run a 50-person company, or do you plan, you know, significant growth? And how do you plan to exit this, or do you do you have an exit plan at some point in the future? Well, you know, they say entrepreneurs' uh, their lifespan with a, a a company is seven years, but if really pushed, it's 12 years. So I'm on that 12th year, and, and I, I get why they say it because you're just wanting to try some new things. Every services company wants to be a software company. So we've tried on several occasions to productize our service and, and poured some money into it. Um, we have a couple of ideas that we're working on now think, uh, having to do with uh, um, reselling some technology that, that is complementary with our service. You know, if we keep going 35% year over year, you know, I'm in no hurry to, to get out of it. Um, but, you know, if the right offer came along, I mean, we have people buzz through every so often, but they're always looking at a financial buy. So they're looking at you know one to two times revenue or five to eight times EBITDA. And that, to me, just isn't that enticing. I mean, we've got a great company, a great team. But, um, but a strategic buyer could change things, you know, because you know, we've had some big consulting companies look at us and say, you know, that's exactly what we're looking for, but they just haven't been able to put all their you know, ducks in a row to, to make it happen. Um, so if a strategic buyer came by and asked you know, for five times revenue, uh, or you know, offered five times revenue, I think I would talk to them. I'm going to be the last one. Well, I don't know if I should be. The, uh, does somebody else want to ask it then? <laughs> uh, I'm uh, focused on these core, core tenets of uh, on entrepreneurship and trying to compare uh, when you were at the UK with your your startup, essentially yeah. putting other people's money at risk, yep. versus uh, at NPI when your risk taking is about your own money, what are the implications of uh, of risk in those two different uh, situations and how you um, manage that uh, risk? It's almost a trade off, perfectly correlated. Uh, you know, for every bit of risk that you take. Uh, the reward is that much greater. Um, you know, I mean, I'll tell you that the time I had in the UK is some of the best times I've had, and the team members that I've met there. I mean, that's one thing I wanted to point out: is money is great, money is important. I can't remember what my W twos were from '97 to '98 to '99, you know, or you know, any time. As much as I remember the team moments and the wins and the failures that we had, uh, those are what stick with me. Now, having said that, when it's your business and it's your baby, it means, I mean, it's so much sweeter than when you're, but I could never have done what I'm doing now if I hadn't gone through that with uh, my previous companies. Thank you. Uh, John, thanks for coming to Georgia Tech today. We yeah. appreciate Thank it very you. much.